together the spokeswoman for the King of Glory this morning, Reverend Claudia De La Cruz. How's everybody doing? God is good. All the time. Oh, we got to say that like we mean it. God is good. All the time. Amen. I am blessed and so happy to be here. Pastor Mike, you are amazing. This church is amazing. I, I left the church for many different reasons. Um, and one of the reasons and the main reason was I thought God wasn't necessarily working her way there. Um, I believe in the feminine image of God. So it doesn't bother me to say goddess. I believe Jesus was a revolutionary and a political prisoner. And it doesn't bother me to put that in the forefront, particularly in the historical, political, and economic times in which we're living. God needs to be relevant. Jesus needs to be relevant. So I am blessed to be in this space because I have gone to church and church is in me and I am grateful. Thank you. I was asked by Pastor Mike to speak on strong women in the Bible. And I looked at Ruth. How many of you have heard about the story of Ruth? Looked at Esther, Mary, Mary Magdalene. But I was particularly looking for unnamed women. <laughs> in the Bible, um, mainly because in the world in which we live, we've learned that unless you have a name, unless you're called, unless you're placed on the spotlight, you are nothing. <laughs> and there was this woman in Judges. Do, do people carry Bibles these days? All right. Let's, let's, do, let's do some interactive thing. Who has a Bible? Come here, sis. You raised your hand. Don't act like you didn't want to be called on. She raised the Bible like I got one. Can we go to Judges 9? 40, verse 49. And if you need a stand, you can use this one. Come on. Come here. Come here. 49 to 54. So each of the people likewise cut down his own bow and follow Abimelech, put them against the stronghold, and set the stronghold on fire above them, so that all the people of the tower of Shil Shilim died, about a thousand men and women. Then Abimelech went to the Bez, and he encamped against the Bez and took it. But there was a strong tower in the city, and all men and women, all the people of the city, fled there and shut themselves in. Then they went up it to the top of the tower. So Abelamid came as far as the tower and fought against it, and he drew near the door of the tower and burned with fire. But a stuttering woman dropped up a upper millstone on Abelamid's head and crushed his skull. Then he called quickly to a young man, to an arm bearer, and said to him, Draw your sword and kill me, lest men say of me, a woman killed me. So his young man thrust him through, and he died. And when, he, and when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed, every man to his place. Thus God repaid the wickedness of Abimelech, which he had done to his father by killing his 70 brothers. And all the evil of men and Shalom God returned on their own heads, and on them came the curse of Jonathan, the son of Jeroboam. Amen. Thank you. So I must say that is, for me, much more difficult to preach from the Old Testament than it is from the New Testament for many reasons. But this particular text caught my attention because of the unnamed woman and because of the brave act this woman committed in the context in which she lived. Imagine, imagine, in the context of today, being in a space where a village 
let's say Berta Cáceres in Honduras. Has anybody heard that name? Who's heard that name? Okay, Berta Cáceres was an environmentalist in Honduras. She, she fought for the right of the land of the people who live there. Corporations are taking over a lot of the land in Latin America. I mean, North Dakota is happening, right? Here. So we could draw parallels. This woman fought against the taking over of the land and the displacement of the natives and was killed, right? This woman was as brave as this woman in the Bible. Berta Cáceres, this whole hashtag say her name thing, say her name, okay? When we're talking about women who dare to throw a stone at an enemy, kill them, not with violence, self-defense, and you could take that metaphorically, or you could take that literally. It's up to us how we take it. We get twice, three times, four times the violence, the punishment, the hurt, the pain in comparison to men. There is more than half of the population that's female. More than half, and we obviously birth the rest of the population. And yet we are forced to live in a world that mirrors the image of men. And not what men are supposed to be, but what men have conditioned to be. Okay, so when we talk about toxic masculinity, that's a construction and it serves a purpose, okay? And to talk about toxic masculinity and to talk about the passive development of womanhood, we need to think about why that was constructed. There were forces who created this. In the times of Jesus, I mean, we all church people here, right, for the most part. Jesus was fighting who? Who was Jesus fighting? He was fighting an empire. He was fighting a state that created poverty. And unless we, I don't know, live in some other worlds, poverty is a crime. Not the poor, poverty is a crime. And yet the state is never held accountable for creating such condition. So in that time, in that context, there were women like this unnamed woman who dared face the enemy and free her people, unnamed. And so I wanna bring to the, to the space women who are unnamed and think about the women in your life who are unnamed. You know, our great grandmothers, our great great grandmothers, women who have been forgotten and hurt in history, right? We need to reclaim it and make history because these women are part of our DNA and are part of who we are. And all those things that come out of us here and there, the bravery, the courage, the weakness, the vulnerability are part of that, okay? When I was 13 years old, I like to say stories, so bear with me. And when I was 13 years old, I came to church. Church gave me my political framework. Church politicized me and made me understand that Jesus, yes, was the man who was anointed by God, but there were many others who were also anointed by God. And I, and all of us have that divine power to be like that Jesus, okay? Um, in that church, I came in and the first sermon I heard was talking about state violence and empire. And the woman that had been brought in to speak that day was a ex-political prisoner from Chile. Her name, Nieves Aires. She was 25 years old when the US backed coup happened in Chile. And the popular elected president 
was killed. September 11, 1973. This woman was taken in to a concentration camp. She was tortured. Reproductive systems ripped. And as they ripped them, they said, we don't want you to carry any more revolutionaries. We don't want you to carry any more revolutionaries. Because she dared to say that her nation, her country had the right to exist. Independent from the imperialist ways of the United States of America. She was standing there with such strength, with such bravery. People were crying, I mean bawling, everybody crying, and she was there, very, very dignified and composed being. And she said, all of that happened, and it was meant to happen. And when I went to Cuba as an exile, they worked through all my reproductive systems, and I was able to bear a daughter, and I called her Victory. And when she said that, it was uh, particularly powerful to me as a 13-year-old to say, you could go through so much for the love of your people. Stand in front of a congregation and say, we are in Victory. She was born, and she's here. And she calls on her daughter and her daughter rises. And the pastor asks, what are you doing? She says, I'm working on building community schools before community schools were popular in 1994. She was too a revolutionary. So the enemy didn't win. For her, from Nieves, I get resilience, endurance. There was another woman who I met I mean, after hearing the case of her son, this young man was killed running from the cops, walks into his house, goes into the bathroom, cops come rushing in and they kill him in front of his grandmother and his six-year-old brother, four-year-old brother at that time. This woman's name is Constance Malcolm, a mother against police brutality in New York City. Her love for her son has moved her into this place of movement building. But she acknowledges that what she's doing is not only for Romarley, because Romarley's dead. Her commitment is not to have that happen ever again to any other black child. And she has been in the movement ever since. Constance Malcolm is her name. And from her I draw the same love that is radical, that is subversive, that's transformative, that is agape love, unconditional. It happened to my son, but it must not happen to any other child ever again. Her name is Constance Malcolm. Another woman that I wanted to bring up or race up today is my own grandmother. Her name is Amantina. In Latin, Amantina means she who loves much. And she dared to love everybody, even when people weren't necessarily loving her back. She understood herself as a black Dominican woman. That's unfortunately rare in my country because we have experienced colonization and imperialism. And because we've been taught to believe that the oppressor is what we need to aim to look like. So a lot of self-hate happens in the Dominican Republic. My grandmother never really told me about her time working in the sugarcane fields. Um, but she was probably 13 or 12 when she started working the sugar plane, um, sugar, um, the sugar, the sugar cane fields. And we used to talk a lot about Haitian Dominican relationships. How many of you know what's happening in the Dominican Republic right now 
around Haitians and Dominicans. Well, in the Dominican Republic, my beautiful island, they've decided to say that Haitians who were born there, going back to 40 years, are not Dominican. They're not Dominican. Mind you, there's a whole bunch of other immigrants in that country. There's Jews, there's folks from the Middle East, but we dare to say that Haitians particularly are not good enough to be citizens, even if they have four generations, okay? Because Haiti is a poor country and because Haiti is a black country. Well, my grandmother was very, very keen in reminding me that Haiti was the first black free nation in this continent. She was very good at letting me know your hair is not only something to be trendy or beautiful, that too is political. You walking around as you are in this space that is anti-black, that is anti-poor, is revolutionary already. So before I got into theory and theology, she was my pastor and my theologian. And she grounded me and humbled me enough to know that as a black Latina and as a black woman walking this earth, as a poor woman walking this earth, my victory is connected to the victory of the world. My pain is connected to the pain of the world. And the pain of the world lives in me. I remember her saying something like, we got big hips because we carry the world. So don't you ever complain about having big hips. The blackness in you <laughs> has you carrying the world. And I heard us talking about burdens. You know, these things are beautiful, but they're also a burden. Because again, we live in a, in a world that is mirrored to men's image. And in this world, when a woman's assertive, you're usually called aggressive. When you dare to speak up, you're loud. And unless you speak up, you're not powerful, right? So silence, you live in a contradiction. Cherise is laughing. You live in a contradiction. You just can't be. You can't be powerful because then you want to be like a man. And then you can't be soft because then you're too weak. Right? I think it's important for, for us to encourage each other, particularly women, particularly girls, to be women, to be girls, and start deconstructing, just like the toxic masculinity, that passive womanhood. We don't have to be nice all the time. We don't have to smile if we don't want to. We don't have to speak unless we feel so. And if we don't feel so, it's okay to be silent. Power, strength, comes in so many different forms and in so many different ways. And all the women in the Bible portray these different ways of strength. My sister Ra spoke about Agar. There was strength in her. There was strength in her, just like there was strength in this unnamed woman who dared to put herself on a line. Just like there was strength in Priscilla. How many of you know who Priscilla was? Who's Priscilla? What were you saying? Okay, tell me more. You can always say skip me and I'll go to the next one. Skip, touch a neighbor. <laughs> Who else? Priscilla. Right here. She helped Paul during his ministry. She was a part of it. She was part of it. Helped Paul go through the ministry. And is it Corinthians or Corinthians? Do you remember her husband's name? Aquila. A lot of the times when we talk about Priscilla, we name her in relations to her husband. Right? I hate when people are like, hey, meet. 
that's her, her wife. I'm like, okay, this person doesn't have a name. And this person's obviously not of value if it's not in relation to the husband. You know, so these things are true even for what we learn around the Bible. Priscilla was an educator. She was an organizer. She, she mentored, you know, she was able to influence discipleship. But yet all these things are taken away from her when we fail to look into the history or herstory. Let me say that right. To look into the herstory of who Priscilla was. So there's good news and there's bad news. And I'm about to wrap it up here. Because he said I could go on forever. And God knows I could go on forever. But I'm not going to go on forever. I know that there are other things. The good news is that men and women were created. Female and male. And Gentile. What does the scripture say? Gentile. Men. Woman, we are the body. And if the head doesn't work, when you get a headache, uh, actually, no, let me get in a smaller. When, you're, when your finger hurts, it's, I mean, I smashed this finger too many times. I could do things with it that I'm not supposed to do. <laughs> when I smashed it, I couldn't sleep because my head hurt. If we're all part of the body, and there is this little piece of the body that's hurting. Your head should hurt. And if it doesn't, there's something wrong with you. If you are in a space and men and men and men are being called upon and men is the word and men is what they say and men, men, somebody should do what this unnamed woman did and say, so what about the woman? Were they women in history? We are part of the body. And we should feel the pain of all the parts in our body. And the good news is that we carry the feminine image of God within us. And therefore, we need to acknowledge that. And if it is okay to say God, it is also okay to say goddess. And if it's okay to say God was strong and mighty, it is okay to say God was able to hold his children in her bosom. And that's not weak. That's actually very, very strong. Those of us who are mothers know <laughs> that it gets hella tired. <laughs> so, again, strength comes in so many different forms, and we need to be, begin to deconstruct, and I guess that's where the challenging piece of this scripture, of this reflection lies, that we need to begin to deconstruct what strength has been taught for us to believe that it is. There is a poem that, um, how many of you have heard of Julia de Burgos? Anybody? She was a, uh, oh, look, Idaline is raising her hand. I'm glad you have. Idaline is a Puerto Rican, uh, Idaline is a Puerto Rican poet too, but <laughs> Julia de Borgos was a Puerto Rican feminist, New Rican poet um, who wrote this piece in Spanish. I translated it, hopefully it comes out right. I want it to be like men wanted me to be, an attempt at life a game of hide and seek with my being. But I was made of nows, and my feet level on the promissory earth would not accept walking backwards, and went forward, forward, mocking the ashes to reach the kiss of new paths. At each advancing step on my route forward, my back was ripped by the desperate flapping wings of the old guard. But the branch was unpinned forever. And at each new whiplash, my look separated more and more and more from the distant familiar horizons. And my face took the expansion that came from within 
the defined expression that hinted at a feeling of intimate liberation, a feeling that surged from the balance between my life and the truth of the kiss of the new paths. I already, my curse now set in the present. I felt myself a, blo a bluesome of all the soils of the earth, of the soils without history, of the soils without a future, of the soil always soil without edges, of all men and all the epochs. And this, and I, sorry, and I was all in me as was life in me. I wanted to be like men wanted me to be, an attempt at life, a game of hide and seek with my being. But I was made of nows when the heralds announced me at the regal parade of old guard, the desire to fellow men warped in me and the homage was left waiting for me. Julia de Burgos. In this world created by men, we have the challenge of being women and being in process and knowing that we too were created to the image of God. Amen? Amen. Amen.